Hey everybody, welcome to the Real Talk podcast. Uh, today's guest we have on is Reverend Clarence Bauman. He is uh, newly retired, fresh off, uh, yeah, fresh into retirement, I should say, and from the Smithville congregation. So we're very excited to have him here today. We're going to be talking about uh, the topic of what is the church. Now, you may be wondering, this is quite a broad topic. And where are we going to go with this? But we do have a plan. We have a script. <laughs> Stick point. with us here. So we're going to try to keep this organized. It's yeah, we could go a million and one ways, but we're excited to have Reverend Bowen here. And uh, I guess I'll just throw it over to you, Reverend Bowen. Maybe explain to the folks who you are, where you're from, where you served, and then we'll get into what is the church. Yeah, thank you, uh, Lucas, uh, Tyler. It's good to be with you. And uh, I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to talk about something that's as important as the church. Um, as to who I am, well, uh, yeah, I've, I grew up in the area here, of course, and uh, went to the seminary in Hamilton. And uh, after that, uh, yeah, went around the globe uh, serving churches first in, in Chilliwack, then a couple in Australia, and then back to the Fraser Valley and uh, to uh, to uh, Smithville. Um, going around the globe certainly does make you see something more of the church gathering work of the Lord and give you a different um, insight into what's happening, um, mm. how he is busy with his work. Uh, yeah. Yes, so I served in Canada and I served in Australia, but in the process, I've also uh, traveled to other countries, uh, mission fields, um, and seen how that works and participated in that. So yeah. all in all, it's been quite the journey and <laughs> an eye-opening thing. And yeah, then you learn this, that, and the other about it. Good well, stuff. How's retirement being so far? <laughs> How's retirement been? You know what? It's, it's it's much too new in the in the game to to really answer that question. Uh, um, at this stage, I really haven't figured out what it means to be retired. I know. I think that's a common thing for a minister to say. Yeah, <laughs> and maybe not just for ministers, but whatever the case might be. Yeah, here I am. Wow. As you uh, ruminate about maybe what retirement is, we can uh, hopefully look at some of the insight you have on what the church is. And I guess I'm thinking, yeah, if we can, we can kind of jump into that. So you, this, the kind of the inspiration for this came uh, from a series of, of lectures you gave, uh, post-confession lectures. Right. This is going back, yeah, you know, what would you say, eight, nine years? Yeah, like between 12, 13, that yeah. area. Okay. And this was, yeah, talks given in, in Smithville. Yeah. And mm -hmm. um, yeah. so we wanted to kind of come back to it, of course, in light of where we are now with yeah. the pandemic and whatnot. What does it mean to, yeah, what is the church? What does it mean to go to church, to gather and, and all that? So I guess maybe maybe just start us off, yeah, given your experience where you've been around the globe, what is the church to you? All right, let me let me just 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 um, tell you some more about my own um, history in the whole thing. Sure. Um, I grew up the 60s, the 70s, um, Southern Ontario, um, in a time when the whole matter of church was 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 a big thing in terms of discussions, uh, and the reason it was a big thing in uh, in in, uh, in Clarion as well as synod decisions as well as uh, family discussions around our kitchen table and so on, was um, this whole understanding of what church is was opening up um, as the churches came to realize that there's more to Christ's church gathering work in North America than we were used to. So let me just back up a second and put some context to that. Hmm. When the um, migrants first came uh, post-World uh, War II to uh, Canada, the intent was we are going to join an existing church. Absolutely we're confident the Lord gathers a Catholic church, so there's undoubtedly a church of the Lord already in Canada. Um, so just to stay now with uh, circumstances in the area where I yep. pastored, so Niagara Peninsula, um, the first liberated migrants joined the Christian Reformed Church, um, St. Catharines or Hamilton, and... Uh, 
sought to be living members of those churches. And that includes, um, you know what, there's been discussions in Holland in the liberation of 1944 and so on, and what is church and uh, uh, what is baptism and what is the role of synod and all these various topics. And the intriguing and the very disappointing thing is that uh, once they raised these topics, they found there was no place left for them in the Christian Reformed Church. Um, hmm. One of the brothers was an office bearer, was suspended um, within three weeks of raising the topic. Really? Um, there was no home, so now what do you do? Hmm. So they tried to join the Protestant Reformed Church in Hamilton. Okay. And same sort of scenario. Yes, they could be Protestant Reformed, provided they stated the Protestant Reformed distinctives. Well, those distinctives clashed with the experiences they had in the time of the liberation back in the Netherlands. And so they said, you know what? That's not faithful to Scripture either. So now what do we do? And hence the formation of a new federation, um, the Canadian Reformed Churches. Then in the 60s, you get the awareness the migrants had to settle down and learn the language and what else is happening in North America and yep. so on and so forth. Mm. In the 60s, you get the awareness that, you know what, there's, there's also churches in the States, Presbyterian churches. Are they faithful? Mm. Well, that became the big discussion. Um, and then in the mid-60s, mid um, um, that matter ended up on the Synod table in relation to the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. But my point now is that in the mm. years that followed, the whole matter of church, are there more churches of the Lord? Is the Lord working in Canada, North America, beyond the Canadian Reformed churches? Yeah. Um, we had to find our way in that. Um, but the result is it became a big discussion point. Oh, interesting. And uh, yeah, look, in my own uh, growing up years then, this, this, this these were formative discussions. Um, church, where you go to church, why you go to church. Um, what do you need to hear in church? These were big questions. And uh, yeah, once I got to Australia, um, those questions were very much alive then too, mm. if only because um, the Australian churches when I got there in the uh, 80s um, were busy with the same question that the Canadians were busy with in the 60s, finding out that perhaps there is more to the Lord's work in our country than we're aware of. Mm. But it does result in... Now I'm a minister, right? Yeah. Uh, you got a lot more study and got to answer some hard questions. And uh, the result is, yeah, I had to do a fair bit of thinking on the topic. Um, and that's what got me interested in it and in a position to do a series of lectures yeah, um, for sure. a number of years ago. And so you asked me, so so, so, what is church? Um, let me answer that with, with, with saying emphatically that the church is not a club. Okay. Um, any organization um across our society um it's people doing things together like-minded people doing their like-minded thing um, together yeah. um a club yeah. a church is a whole different ball of wax simply because we're talking here about the work of jesus christ once you think church you can't think first of all people You've got to think, first of all, Jesus Christ. Mm. Jesus Christ died on the cross to atone for sin. Crucified, dead, buried, and actually rose from the dead. I mean, the historical record is convincing. Dead Jesus arose. And equally, mm. the historical record is convincing Risen Jesus ascended. I mean, this is stuff that we don't see, we mm. don't experience. Yeah. But it happened. Yep. Ascended, exalted to become King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So, King of Canada, sovereign in today's world. Mm. And what's he doing in the world? In Ephesians 1, the Apostle McSplain is gathering his church. It's all about the church, yeah. the bride of Christ. That's what I say. When you talk church, don't talk people. Yeah. You've got to talk first about 
Christ and uh, and who he is. But what it really means too, guys, though, is that this is exciting stuff. What's this world here for? Mm. For the glory of, glory God. of God. Yeah. yeah. How? Well, he wants to gather a people for himself to share his glory, enjoy his glory. Mm. And then to be involved in that, to be part of that, be it as a member of the church, be it as a preacher of the gospel, as an office bearer. It's such an incomprehensible privilege. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, the, and, and, and that's the stuff we've got to bear in mind, first of all, mm. uh, when we talk church. For sure. Yeah, so you mentioned that the church is the bride of Christ. I mean, the Bible has a lot of different ways to describe the relationship between Christ and his church. Um, yeah, maybe we can just outline a few of those so that we can just kind of frame, you know, what the church is um, as a body and then, you know, how, I guess not so much how we fit into it as members, but just understand the, the larger cosmic kind of um, relationship between Christ who is gathering the church and, and the church who will, you know, be a fulfilled, you know, entity at, yeah. the, at the end. Yeah, there's a lot there. Um, let me just start with and, and answer your question. You use the word body, and and, and I think that's a, that's a very apt, well, it's a very biblical um, picture that the Lord uses to describe the church, um, the body. We've all got one of those, mm -hmm. um, and Christ is the head. Um, whatever makes particular members of the body function, hands, feet, whatever, right? Um, instructions come from the head. Um, well, Christ is the head. Um, but it's equally true that um, every member of my body, yeah, connected directly or perhaps indirectly to my head, is thereby also connected to each other. Mm. Um, the five friends on my hand um, are always doing things together. Mm. Yeah. But as they do things together, they need my eyes. They need my feet to get these five friends to whatever it is I want to pick up. Um, mm. They're all intimately, every member of the body is intimately connected together. And so you get very much the, the picture of the, the vertical, if you will, um, the, 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 the members' relation with Christ, yeah. but equally relation together. The, mm. the word body um, encompasses both of those concepts. Um, another element that the word body very much catches is a notion of togetherness. Um, to dismember a, a digit of my hand is to, is to kill that digit, that finger, mm. but it's equally to handicap the rest of me. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, so this notion of togetherness, uh, we're needing to see each other as a body yeah. belonging together, oneness and hence, be together. Um, another term that the scripture uses repeatedly to describe the church is a flock, yeah. uh, where the, mm -hmm. the, the members are the sheep. Um, and the scripture is insistent, right, that um, sheep scattered are, uh, are sheep vulnerable. Um, the sheep need to be together. They're, they're a flock. Um, the scripture uses the, the notion of a family, um, brethren. Um, mm. Well, Brothers spend time together, or are interested in each other, understand each other, support each other. Um, the church is a family, and um, which gets me to the to the word um, church. The uh, the term that's uh, um, translated repeatedly in the Bible as church in the New Testament in the Greek is ecclesia, and the Old Testament is kahal, um, and both of those terms describe the notion of gathering, of, of assembly. Mm -hmm. um, what's really interesting is that the um, Greeks in the days of the apostles um, were very familiar with what an ecclesia was. Um, what was it? It was just a, a meeting of the citizens of town um, to conduct town business, sure. official mm -hmm. business of town. Yeah. And that's how it's used in Acts 19 as well. Um, 
in relation to that uh, riot in Ephesus. Mm -hmm. But that's the same word, eh? the, the gathering of the citizens of town. That's the same word that the really? Holy Spirit uses time and again in relation to, uh, to the church. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, Christ has, uh, has uh, come to establish the kingdom of heaven on earth. The church is the gathering of the obedient citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And they gathered to conduct official kingdom business. Yep, right. Specifically, the king speaks. The, the king issues his words of grace um, to the citizenry, to the, to, to the believers, uh, to mm. the, the, uh, the, the people of the church. He uh, opens the word. He preaches. Um, he mm. listens to what they have to say, um, prayer, uh, mm. yeah. and, and, and so on, right? Um, so does, okay. does the church have to be together to be the church then? Um, I mean, we don't yeah, have to jump into see, all you that. Do, you, but... you do see these signs around the countryside these days, eh? The yeah. church must mm. gather. Yeah. Uh, of course, mm. um, COVID has uh, given particular challenges to that. Um, but the answer is yes. The church must gather. Um, the only... And, and I think we have to... We, we, we need to keep insisting on that. Um, virtual church... Um, worshiping together online um, simply isn't the real thing, yeah. uh, which isn't to say there's no place for it. Um, but, well, it's, excuse the wording, but nothing beats breathing the same air. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, Just that's being good. together yeah. and, uh, and, and, and listening to each other. Uh, I, I find it so striking that... Um, the scripture, when it talks about um, the church and the gathering, take Acts 2, um, after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the saints are together. Um, but what are they doing there? They're, they're fellowshipping. What does that term catch? Um, you can't, the term fellowship does not catch the notion of, 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 of so many stones together on a pile. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? There's more and going on. There's more going on. Yeah. There's there's a chemistry. There's there, there's talking. There's mm -hmm. there's connecting, um, one anothering. Um, You're feeding off each other, which works with the biblical analogies you were you were talking yeah, about before yeah, too, right? Absolutely, absolutely. You're being body. You're yeah. you're supporting the each sheep other. are safer together. Like yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. But once you have a uh, a group who does that, fellowships and spends time together. Um, and so understands the uh, the struggles that each that the other has. Mm. Why then you also listen to the word of God together in a different way than if you're disjointed stones that happen to be warming up your square foot of pew together, mm -hmm. right? Then you have the other in mind, and yeah. you listen that way, and then take the sermon home. Mm. Work with it yourself, but equally have a coffee with your yeah fellowship again. Back to fellowship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting the the levels, the different kind of styles of communication that we have nowadays. Like the you know, if you were to email someone or leave someone a voicemail or call them on the phone or you just go and actually sit down and talk to them, how much different information gets relayed through that and the the intangible difference of actually you know coming face to face with face to face with somebody and. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I, you know, I'm sure many of us have felt that over the last year, like being apart, um, uh, many of our churches and then, you know, actually being able to worship together again, you know, though, you know, possibly being, you know, social distance, you mm -hmm. know, um, which again is like a, another, another step, like staying six feet apart from each other is not natural either. So no, it um, isn't just imagine, you know, if you couldn't, you know, could actually, uh, it's not quite gathering. Like it's close, but it's not quite. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, you know, I, it works around a kitchen table, perhaps you got a yeah. big table. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, but you're 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 still spending time together, quality mm -hmm. time and uh and, and and connecting. You're you're looking each other in the eye and you're yeah. uh you're reading body language, mm -hmm. you're reading tone. Uh, yeah. and so much more gets communicated than by a text or yeah. a phone call or a Zoom mm. meeting even. Yeah. Um, Interestingly, I don't think people are very good at staying apart from each other when they want to, you know, when, when they see each other, like, oh, you know, what? You know what? 
<laughs> you're you're you're, you're, you're but, uh, so right. You're so right. Which but, is not all to say, and I should hasten to add that that uh, that there is no place for uh, for not gathering. And now I'm referring to what is the norm of scripture, and the norm is very much gathering. But what mm-hmm. happens when I don't know? Um, there's a child sick. Well, clearly, mom stays home, okay. right? And mm. uh, that can be for one week, but it can also, in theory, be for considerably longer. That mm. uh, that someone can't gather, um, and these are things you need to receive from God's hand, and then find ways to uh, to nevertheless um, connect meaningfully. Mm. Um, you know what? In the mm. years of my ministry, I uh, I once had a, uh, I was I was eleven years in a given congregation, and there was a member in that congregation of that flock that never once appeared in church in the time I was there. She had a particular health issue that hindered her, mm. but she was very much a living member of the congregation. She belonged, and everybody mm. knew she belonged, and she knew she belonged. And she made her business to connect meaningfully. My point mm. is, yes, the church must gather. But there are circumstances that the Lord gives that you have to acquiesce to it may not always happen just according to the norm. Mm. Which is also why we ought not to panic on the whole, the whole COVID thing. Um, yeah, the norm is. Perhaps there is a health issue. Mm. I know I'm not the judge. God yeah. hasn't called me to be the judge of that. Right. Um, but when somebody who has been called to make the, uh, to make that judgment says, you know what, there is a pandemic. Um, well, yeah, you know what, you've got to take that seriously. Mm. Yeah. So anyway, as soon as you that's, can, you're back yeah. to the exercising the norm. Yeah, that's yeah, a for whole sure. other issue. Yeah, well, I think that, we want to understand like, you know, from the church side of it, you know, we can, we talked about COVID before. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just curious because yeah. you're, you're saying the authority to call the church to gather, that comes from that, that would be Christ's call. Christ is calling Absolutely. the church to gather, right? And I guess the church is uh, Christ's bride and Christ's yeah. uh, representative, I suppose, like on, on this earth, like as a minister mm-hmm. and as a consistory, you're called to, yeah, to shepherd the flock, to call yep. the flock to worship. Yeah, that's correct. So, so would it be in the jurisdiction of consistory to be able to make that call based on the safety of their members? The answer to that is it is it is absolutely the that the task of the consistory of the elders to call the congregation together. Um, but in so doing, the elders have to recognize the authority that the Lord has given to the secular authorities. Sure. Yeah. And so I recall an instance when I grew up. In fact, they had one not that long ago in Smithville that um, a couple of years back that the authorities um, closed the highway because of a snowstorm. Mm. Well, what do you do then? Then you can say, you know what, we're going to defy. We're going to insist that our people come to church. But that's just not so smart. I mean, no, you if, have to make a wise choice. But if the authority is closed, then then then, yeah, then, then, mm-hmm. then 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 somewhere you're going to have to yeah. recognize right. that. Right and so it is also when it comes to to, to the pandemic. Uh, if the authorities say this thing is real, then uh, okay. Yeah, They're yeah, called yeah. before God, by God, and have to give account to God for, yeah. for that ruling. For sure. Um, uh, but as with, as with the consistory as well, right? Yeah, but their right. default is going to have to be, you know what, we take seriously what the authorities say. And uh, yeah, we could discuss this in quite a <laughs> length. <laughs> well, we could, yeah, just, because, uh, what, you, what you get next is, uh, yeah. but I don't agree with the authority's conclusion. Yeah. I don't think it's as serious as they say. Well, yeah. okay. Well, that's that's whole. We don't have to get into all we the, don't have to the get science into that of that and whatever. But mm-hmm. I'm just interested no. in like who holds the authority. Ultimately, it is the elders. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. Mm-hmm. Interesting. 
All right, so we can get yeah. back to the church stuff. I yeah, just was like, a, we, we, yeah, it was, the it's opportunity was there, and I was curious what you thought about that. Well, it's very, yeah, no, that's it's very relevant to, I think, to understand. Right? Yeah. Now, we had a point down here. All right, again, there's plenty we could touch, but obviously the church is, is not the building, um, but the people, but it's not just a gathering of people. It's, you know, Christ gathering his people. That is what the church is. Now, you were mentioning earlier that in the 60s and the 70s, there was this kind of, uh, I suppose, a, a reckoning of, okay, like Christ is active. And maybe I just quote what you said in this, in this email here, but like that Christ is active in churches outside of the CanRC, right? Now, then you get into the whole discussion around true church and false church and churches that are pure and less pure, which if I am remembering correctly, is inside the true and the false paradigm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So maybe you can walk walk our listeners through it. I mean, yeah, we have the listeners are kind of mm. across the age spectrum, but certainly there's a, a fair amount of younger ones as well who are probably not familiar with the history in terms of yeah dealing with with the OBC, FRC, NRC, URC. You talked a lot about that, or at least a bit about that in the lectures. So are you able to kind of walk us through some of the history of that and how that relates to the true and the false and the pure and the less pure? Okay, I'll give that a bit of a try. <laughs> yeah. um, let me start with 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 the terms true, false, pure, and less pure. Let me let me let me start with that. Um I think it's accurate to say that the term true church ought not to exist. The church by definition should be true. Mm. Take the notion of money. We don't talk about true money. We do talk about counterfeit money. Mm. And that's because the term money, but subconsciously we attach the notion of truthfulness to um, what's on the table there, that, 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 that $10 note. Mm. Um, and it's only when it's not the real thing that we attach the word counterfeit or false. Hmm. And I think by extension, we ought to be doing the same thing in relation to the church. The Lord is gathering a church. Okay, we know what hmm. that is, the gathering of the people of God. Um, that Satan is a copycat um, and would love to generate something that looks like the real thing, think counterfeit money, counterfeit church. Mm. His purpose, of course, is to deceive. It's the liar from the beginning. That's the understanding of the word false, counterfeit, looks like the real thing isn't the real thing. That's the vocabulary that was used in the continental confessions back in the 16th century. It's what you'll find in the Belgian confession, true, false, um, Helvetic confessions, um, etc. Um, but as the um, years went by, there was also the observation that not every church, i.e. true church versus counterfeit, right? Mm -hmm. Not every church is as healthy, is as holy as it ought to be. Mm -hmm. And reference is made then to the seven letters of Revelation 2 and 3, mm -hmm. Uh, where Jesus has uh, words of commendation to say to the one church and words of condemnation to another church. Um, but they are all his churches. Mm. So there, there, there is um, yeah, a degree, if you will, of, of health or lack of it. Um, but how do you express that? And in that context arose terms like pure and less pure. And that's the language you find in the uh, in the Westminster Confession. 
Um, it's the language that uh, attaches to the Presbyterian churches across North America, um, whereas language like true-false you find more in the Reformed churches, uh, having the three forms of unity. Um, but now the temptation becomes to, uh, to say, you know what, um, true church, false church is so black and white and hence sounds extremist, yeah, mm -hmm. simplistic. judgmental, mm -hmm. um, especially in our world of celebrating tolerance, yeah. um, mm -hmm. maybe we should use less radical terms, less extreme words, and then and, and, and talk about pure and less pure church. Um, and that in part has fed into um, the use of that language in a way that's different from the intention in the Westminster Confession. Um, and so the observation that there's any number of churches in a given town, a uh, given city, um, all right, let's put them on a scale. Um, mm. Some are better, some are worse. They're all churches of the Lord. Let's be gracious and call the one more pure and the other less pure um, and get away from the true false vocabulary. As to whether that's a good thing, that's the kind of discussion that arose then when you get to talking about, okay, so we're finding the OPC, we're finding the Reformed Church of the United States, we're finding the Presbyterian Church um, of America, the PCA, uh, the RPCNA, and so on. Um, and the temptation then is to attach, like I say, the grid of more or less pure to mm. that. Um, but is that indeed the intent and the the answer is no that that, that, that simply was not the intent mm. but it did generate plenty of discussion and finding a way in in terms of how to use this vocabulary right is that our place then to to judge like i'm thinking as a parent like if you if you have a a, a child who's you know moves to an area or is is dating somebody from a church um is it helpful for us to put some kind of like to make a judgment of a you know quote unquote true church or quote unquote false church um to you know say denominations or individual churches or um i mean obviously we can't speak to the members themselves um because you know there obviously are members in you know king reform church that you know Will, will not be saved and there are members of those churches who will be saved and we can't make those judgments but in terms of the actual churches themselves um how much should we be judging that and and or should we just be saying well you know judge for yourself kind of a and did they settle on some good terminology to use instead of the ones you were talking about mm. <laughs> The ones that I'm using, <laughs> well, the, the ones that you described, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, that, that that question of of of, of should we judge? Um, we're seeing Christ at work, and that I then I do think, oh, we confess Christ is at work, uh, gathering His church, but that also means that we do well to uh, make a point of actually observing it hmm. and daring to say Christ is at work. And then I'm going to suggest that that's what we ought to do, first of all, in relation to ourselves, but hmm. then absolutely not with any measure of pride or conceit or apatiness, but in, I would say, stunned humility. Hmm. Christ is at work here or allowed to be part of it in that awesome, mm -hmm. glorious. But the same Christ is gathering a Catholic church in any land around the globe. Hmm. But then I need to dare to see that. 
and recognize it for what it is and marvel. Um, how do you go about recognizing a particular church as his work? Yeah, he gathers one church, meaning whatever he gathers has one faith. Mm -hmm. He shed one blood to atone for many sins in the process, develops one people, mm. one church, and the preaching is always the same. There's one gospel. There's one Savior. Um, so I think to have our eyes open to see what he is doing, he's given marks to show where he's at work. Yeah, let's humbly, thankfully dare to do that. Let me add right away that our recognizing his work somewhere doesn't now suddenly make it his work, mm. right? He has been busy. Yep. And right. we're seeing yeah. it yeah. and rejoicing. Right. Mm. <clears throat> and, and, and you mentioned hey, uh, you're a parent and, um, yeah, where do your, church, or your children want to go? And, uh, yeah, and that does become, I think, part of the equation too. Let us together mm. um, see uh, where the Lord's at work and, that helps us as parents in directing our children to, yeah, do go there. Right. No, 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 don't go there. Right. Right. So how? So maybe touch on the the term invisible church. I know you don't. You're not a big fan um, uh, of that particular word, um, and I I can't remember what the word that you described it as that would probably better fit that. Um, I think unforeseeable it was a, or something. Yeah. Or, I'll get un to that overseeable. Or, yeah. Or, um, yeah. Yeah. I. Yeah. I mean, I like that term. I'm, I'm just curious about that invisible church concept because we know that, well, the Westminster Confession has the word invisible in it, right? Yeah. Um, just, it, ta it, it speaks to a Catholic church that is not, is not, you know, readily, you know, yeah, I mean, visible in a, a spot in time or, or a place. And yeah. I think that there's a, there's a tendency to use that in a, in a way that we can say, well, we don't know who these people are and perhaps they are in this, this church that you may say is a false church. So how dare you say that's a false church? Um, and yeah. how much of the, you know, it's not like we have a number, like, you know, if 10% of the members there are real Christians, it's still not a false church. I mean, the like, city is saved. there's, there's indicators of the church itself, but then the membership is, is something else. So maybe mm -hmm. just speak to that term a little bit. Yeah. So let me speak to the, to the, the, the concept of, a, of, a, of an invisible church. The, uh, the concept itself, like you say, um, Tyler, is, uh, is, is, is mentioned in the Westminster Confession, uh, amongst others, but it wants to describe the notion of the church as God sees it. Um, the difficulty with that is, and, 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 and the church of God sees it then, and that would be the elect as they are scattered across the face of the earth with uh, a number of elect in this flock, mm -hmm. and somebody elect in that flock and elsewhere. Um, and yeah, in that flock can be sheep, can also be goats, and and, mm. and right, and, and and God sees the reality as it is in a way that we can't. Right, that that that's yeah. the idea that that's caught in the notion of an invisible church. Now, if you think that went through, though, there's a couple of things here, and the one is uh, for us people to try to get our heads around what we think God sees. It's actually mm -hmm. a tad presumptuous. True, yeah. And I think from that angle already, I'd be cautious of that vocabulary. Mm. Perhaps more to the point, though, is um, the notion of, 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 of the invisible church um, has become laden with Platonic philosophy. And that's the notion 
that um, it's understood that God sees the real church in his divine mind. Mm. Um, and on earth would be so many churches who are better or worse representations of the ideal in his mind. Mm. Um, this is Plato. Yeah, right. So um, it's like a, it's come yeah. through the philosophy of Hegel and and, and, and better and worse and, forms of exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, by way of analogy, uh, um, and this is the one that that, that Plato kept on talking about. Uh, yeah, you take the the, the, the heavenly dog. Um, God has a concept, or there's a heavenly concept mm -hmm. of what a real dog is, and every dog on earth is a better or worse representation of the real thing. Yeah. Um, and you take your pick as to what you think is the best yeah. representation, right. and uh, that's yeah. the one that you buy. And uh, you take another one, and, and I get a third uh, preference. Yeah. Um, attach that to church, well, then you go to the church of your choice, uh, which you think is the best representation of the ideal. Hmm. Right, And so every church becomes better or worse representations, and there's something very subjective about well, what do I think? Where am I comfortable? Right. So that misses the mark because it doesn't take into account that we have scripture to give us guidance of what is the better form. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. But also, yeah. how do you... But uh, let me just carry uh, on with this, this, this yeah, notion of, of, of invisible for a bit. Mm -hmm. um, because that there is no doubt that there are invisible aspects, well, to all of life. Sure. I mean... Mm -hmm this body of mine has got invisible aspects to it in the sense that you can't see my kidneys. Mm. Thank goodness. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> yeah. um, but at the end of the day, that doesn't make my kidneys invisible. No. Mm. Right. And that's why I, I, when, when we talk about the church, the, 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 the church is Catholic. The Lord is gathering a church from any tribe, language, race around the globe. Mm. I can't oversee that. I can't see the whole thing for the very simple reason I'm finite. Mm. And here's where I prefer to use the word unoverseeable. Um, mm. Yeah, I've lived in Australia for a number of years, and so I've flown across the Pacific, I'm not sure how many times. Um, but from 35,000 feet, you look down, you see the Pacific Ocean. But not the whole thing. I mean, it's just too big. Yeah. It's unoverseeable. Mm. Uh, and uh, yeah, the Lord gathers a Catholic church. Uh, he, he gathers his church in Canada and Australia mm. and Africa and uh, Indonesia, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I can't oversee the whole thing. That doesn't make it invisible. Mm. It mm. makes it unoverseeable. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. It's more accurate. Because you think the invisible term is loaded with the platonic thought basically, which allows for people to justify church shopping. That's what you get. Yeah. Yeah. So how much of that would be like, um, I'm just thinking if you, if you were to look at say one congregation, then um, the invisible church is not, you know, even if we say this is a, a, a true church, I mean, there's no other distinction. <laughs> this is the church. If we look at that congregation, still the invisible church um idea would would be displayed in there that whereas some we don't know but you know some members may not be elect mm -hmm. they just you know so i guess i guess that's kind of the that's kind of like this the microcosm i guess of when we look at that then we then we see well if some aren't elect here some are our elect over here what you know what gives us the right to judge these people and these people and these people all different. Yeah. And then we get into like the, yeah, church shopping or, or, you know, preference, yeah. you know, um, yeah. In the actual, you know, yeah. worship style and things like that. To speak to, uh, to what you mentioned there, uh, Tyler, in terms of, um, some in the church may be elect and some may not be elect and, 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 and how do we have to see all of that? Um, an analogy that, keeps cropping up in my own thinking is is the one built on 1 Peter 2 where the apostle talks about you being living stones are being built up into a spiritual house mm. like like living stones being mm. built up uh, in other words the notion of construction mm. 
Well, you you look at a house being built. Um, there is stuff in that house that's part of the construction process that doesn't belong in the final sense of the word to what a house is. Right. Right. I mean, um, there's scraps of wood. There's uh, mm -hmm. extra debris. A yeah, horse that the, the the carpenters use to lay their planks on to cut them. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and, and 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 so on and so forth. And I I think we can use that as somewhat of analogy when it comes to the church too. Um, the church is a project. Is Christ's project. Mm. It's not complete. That doesn't make it invisible. It makes it mm. incomplete. It does mean that there's elements in the house, the church, that don't belong in the final sense. And by the time Christ comes back and the church is complete, those scraps of it becomes obvious. lumber will be out the door, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Um, but meanwhile, it's part and parcel of the of the process of, of, of building. Um, I, as a um, curious neighbor, may walk through a house and say, well, that doesn't belong there. That mm. does, but I might be quite wrong. Yeah, right. Right? Um, hmm. I want to return to this idea of church shopping because that's, mm. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting. I'm, yeah, so we went through the word invisible and that's been around for, what 500 years oh yeah long? oh no no the, the word invisible has been there since uh shortly after the new, Test new testament was written okay uh the church fathers have used the word but you, but you take umbrage with it so yeah the church fathers <laughs> 2021 it's, it's all about <laughs> how do you load the word yeah yeah, yeah, yeah I got words you. an old yeah. one yeah but okay but how you understand it is and the understanding is there it's just yeah yeah maybe unforeseeable or unoverseeable would have been better but now, yeah, so it's been latched there. onto yeah. <laughs> the the modern age and the spirit of, of yep. choosing the church. So you talk about, again, in these uh, post-confession lectures about um, the better question is not to say, uh, why are you going to this church? But why are you leaving the church you're in? Mm -hmm. And you talk about the duty that you have to, to stay in the church where, uh, where Christ is active, where the Lord is at work. Yeah. Can you, yeah, speak to why that's a thing uh like how that duty how we know that duty exists where we find that in scripture because that certainly runs up against yeah like many people just church shop and, mm -hmm. and it's the 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 argument from the other side is okay well i'm going to a place where i can serve the lord better so you, it doesn't seem like a selfish argument on on the face of it but are there some deeper mm -hmm. roots that that people are missing there when they're um taking part in that that kind of stuff yeah. Um, I, I think there's a couple of things here. And the one is, again, just to stay with the analogy of a body. Yeah. Um, a body, by definition, is one entity. And no members of this body of mine have the right to um, say, you know what, I'm done with Clarence Bowman. I'm going to leave and become a hand on somebody else's body. Mm. I mean, that just doesn't work. Um, but at the end of the day, that's got to be equally true for the church. I, I, I said at the beginning, when you think church, you can't think, first of all, people. But you have to think, first of all, Christ. Well, if Christ is gathering a particular group of people together, I want to be part of that. Mm. The last thing I want to do is leave where Christ is at work. And of course, the rejoinder is, yeah, but Christ is also at work over here. Mm -hmm. So why do I have to stay here when I could go over here? Um, and, and, and then I think, work with the providence of God. If the Lord in his providence has joined you here to the church, that's where you grew up, for example, and, and, and that's God's work, mm -hmm. um, then that's where you want to be, strive to be a living member. Every member in this body functions differently than any other member of this body. 
right? An eye is not an ear, the apostle says. Um, so the Lord in his providence has joined me to, to this church, and I may say, you know what, but I feel uncomfortable here. Well, yeah, that, 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 that's possible, but it may just be that the church needs you, mm. and you need the church. Um, in the dynamics of Christ completing his church-building work, construction of that house, it may very well be that you're a plank a bit too long and Christ wants to shorten you. Mm. And he may end up doing that by the, the uncomfortableness that you feel with the brothers and sisters in this congregation. Mm. And then to run away and say, yeah, but I don't feel comfortable with this lot. Um, I feel more comfortable with this group. Um, you end up shortchanging yourself. Mm. To use a bit of a different analogy, um, think of the work that sandpaper does on a piece of wood. That's by definition, okay, wood hasn't got feelings, mm -hmm. but run your hand over a sander. Um, you're going to feel it, mm. right? It hurts. <laughs> but by analogy, um, the sanding that the Lord does on that piece of wood that is called me can be painful. But to make me the right countertop for mm. that house, sure. yeah. I may need to undergo that measure of sanding. Mm. Let me not run away from it. Yeah. Mm. Let yes. me learn what there is to learn. You need to be a uh, humble countertop. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. And I, I think, yeah, Christ even said, he said, like, blessed are those who, who are suffering for, for my name's sake. And that, you know, it, you know, you think about that as outward persecution, persecution, you know, from, you know, churches around the world that, you know, aren't us. But then, yep. You know, it can very well be in your own life, in your own church, in your own context. So now it's tricky though, because mm -hmm. there's really it doesn't seem like in the modern age that there's any other domain of life where we just say, Oh, I'm stuck here, like not mm -hmm. gonna fix this problem. Like if you don't like your job, you're gonna go get a new job. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you, I you, suppose you, in marriage you're not supposed to do that, but that happens <laughs> more and more. But oh, yeah, too, too, too right too. Too yeah. right. Um I wouldn't want you to hear me to say that a person who was born into a given church by God's providence must of necessity stay there. Yeah. Mm. Um, I think there can be opportunities and, uh, and circumstances where it is better to go and join this church. But, and I want to speak to, to, to a uh, North American phenomenon, and that's the celebration of individualism. Mm. I do what I want to do. Yeah what suits me. And that is such an unbiblical concept. Hmm. I am not here for me. I am here to serve the other, first God, and they are and also my neighbor. Hmm. And so if the Lord puts me in this church here, I may find it uncomfortable, but my task is to serve here. It's possible that the community comes to understand that for this reason or that, it becomes wiser. I mean, life is broken, and we're not mm. going to fix it. That's Christ's job, not ours. That it becomes wiser to move over here. But it's a community decision mm. as opposed to an individual decision. Mm. It requires conversation with your elders. Mm -hmm. okay. It requires conversation with your peers. It's a, tough, you it's a tough conversation to have, though. Absolutely. What are you, like, you going to say? Ah, I'm really not having fun here. This is, <laughs> this is going terribly. You guys suck. See ya. <laughs> that's, that's a tough one to enact. It is. Mm, it yeah. is. It is. It is. Um, but the thing is, too, that um, my gifts in this particular church, I may feel uncomfortable, 
but it may well be the Lord puts me here simply because the congregation needs me. Mm. I mean, I think the other side of it. Oh yeah, yeah. What, mm. Well, it's like the John F. Kennedy, whatever. Like, uh, don't yeah. ask what you can do for your country, but, or what your country yeah. can do for you. Vice versa, you yeah. go to yeah. That's right. Yeah. What, do, uh, that, actually, what, what yeah. can you do for yes. your country? Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How can you serve? Yes. How to yeah. serve? That's what Christ came to yes. do. Yes. Yeah. So, what is it? What are the the things that we should consider then when, um, like we like to say, like, well, God has put me here in my life, or I feel called to do this. And we've talked about that word to to be called to do something on this podcast a few times. And I still don't really know what to think about it. Why don't we, yeah, well, but, let's ask him because I want to get into that. So too. I'm I'm curious, like, what constitutes the, uh, the call to, say, the local church? So I'm, I live in Hamilton with my wife. But when we got married, I lived in Glanbrook and she lived in Attercliffe. Where we, we didn't, I, I didn't feel any... Um, kind of pull to you know stay in glambrook because we were forming a new family we bought a house and and we were more guided by where the house was than and which was a personal decision because we could have bought a house anywhere we bought a house in hamilton and went to the hamilton congregation um say we up and decide well you know what we like the countryside of smithville better let's move over there more than welcome um move to smithville how much of that is a a personal decision that we should you know, be considering the the calling that we have as members of the body in in Hamilton, as you know, in 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 contrast to you know, we move where we want to geographically for our job. God calls us to do this in our vocation, um, and and a, a host of other factors, schooling for kids, and and you know, do you view it general you view love it? for the countryside? <laughs> well, yeah, that too. Do you view it the same way as when you have to consider? consider a call as a minister in oh, terms of because the yeah. there's always two there's always two calls right like the call to the church you're in and the call to the church that's called you as well yeah, so no, you can look at it like that and, 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 and i think there is there's definite truth in that um you moved to hamilton tyler because you say oh you bought a house there mm. and i'm gonna say good but don't discount God's providence there. The Lord gave you a right. house there. The Lord led you to that particular property through means of his choosing. Should you as a young couple have stayed in Glanbrook or Addercliffe? Look, I won't even bother going there. Yeah, right. But now you have a place in the, in, the, mm. in the Hamilton congregation. Should you stay there or should you go? And again, that's going to depend on so many factors that the Lord uses. Mm. Um, let's, for the sake of the argument, say uh, that uh, that you you receive a job in I don't know St. Catharines, um, and you say you know what uh, because of the commute, um, I want to move Smithville, mm. and I, you know what that's God's providence, mm. and He leads it that way, and we need to be very conscious of how the Lord leads our lives. And now you're speaking, Luke, is more to the question of, okay, but uh, how about the whole matter of um, would there still be a responsibility to the Hamilton congregation? Yeah. Hmm. Um, after all, that's what happens in the minister's call. Right. Right? And then I think, again, the answer is yes. You do have a responsibility to the congregation of which you are a member. Hmm. Um, what sort of a role you play, um, yeah, that can depend from person to person. Um, I can imagine a, a a particular brother who has been elder half a dozen times, um, sixty years old, has a bit of a different role to play than than a newlywed who just parachuted in two years ago, mm. right? Um, and perhaps certainly the older brother may want to 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 think five times: Is it responsible to my present congregation? That I actually move away, mm. and I think those are serious decisions you got to make. You got to think mm. about the well-being of the Church of the Lord. Um, how has the Lord used me? How is He using me? Mm. And, and again, there are so many factors that come into play there. Uh, not only where does the Lord give you work, but um, it's also possible that uh, that um, somebody who has lived in a different congregation for X number of years is no longer effective in that congregation. What happens with ministers? Mm. That equally happens with with elders and families and so on. Yeah. That's part of the brokenness of life. 
Yeah, you need a fresh start sometimes. You need a fresh start. Yeah. Does that uh, <laughs> does that then push people to find a church that they're more quote unquote suited to? <laughs> <laughs> because that seems to be the it's it's always for me something like if I understand that you can weigh out the um, well, I'm being used in this congregation and and you know you're obviously playing some form of a role, though you may undermine that in your own mind anyway. So oh, God, God doesn't need me here. Like you can do with work without me. But you don't necessarily know the needs that you you may fulfill in the other congregation, where a minister may go visit another congregation and and better understand m- maybe the needs that are present there to make a more educated decision. I guess yeah. I, you're not going to necessarily do that as a a car like just a regular lay person in the congregation. You know, I I think that there's there's distinctly truth in that. However. Somebody who has served X number of terms as an office bearer in, let's say, in Hamilton, has learned to have his finger on the pulse and will have a sense of what might the needs be in a neighboring congregation, could I fit? Mm. Given the talents I have, the skills I have, does this place need me? Right. Or does that place need me? Right? and. If you're conscientious in God's service, that, that's going to be a question you weigh up. Hmm. Uh, it's in principle not unlike a minister. Um, admittedly, like you say, Lucas, the minister is going to make a visit and get himself full bottle on the yeah. inside scoop, um, and rightly so. But a conscientious, hmm. godly man is going to develop some sense of where could I serve. Hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a good way to look at it. It's it's difficult to know what the the calling is. This is the one thing that you probably will never parse out. But knowing what a what a calling is for a minister, it's very easy. It's you know, well, here's a call. Um, the church receives a letter, <laughs> and <laughs> and you can very easily say that that is a, a calling from God from a from a congregation. And whether um, that you know he comes to move there is is a different story. I don't know exactly how that. Conversation goes Mind away. you, I did. I think I saw something. I think it was the Clarion, at least, um, talking about how they're posting ads for ministers now. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know if there was controversy around it, but it was an explainer article saying, "Look, like this is it's a bit of a new thing, but here's why it's it's okay." But it's just hmm. a different approach. So it might not even be the traditional like, "Hey, uh, Reverend Bowen, we'd like to call you to this church," sort of thing. Was it like a like it's a like, teach like so a principal it, ad like yeah like that sort of thing like oh, this X church is in need of a minister whatever huh. yeah, you learn something new every day yeah, I didn't interesting know I was uh, I I did see that uh, that that Clarion yeah. Here, yeah it was in my mailbox yesterday yeah. but not had a chance to read it yet but um, oh I don't mind to share with you that uh, I was in conversation with somebody else just yesterday in fact uh, on this matter of uh, of call and um, I ended up saying to the man you know what. Yeah, Smithfield called me um, 10 years ago, and we accepted that call. But God's call was a long time in coming. And the Lord used various circumstances in my own family to nudge me to Mm. Smithville. Not the least of which was that that, that, that one of our daughters— was engaged and sure. going to get married and live in Dunville. Hmm. Well, that's a long way from Yarrow. Yeah. Okay. Um, and our son said, you know what? I'm going to University of Guelph. Hmm. So now we've got two kids in Ontario. Right. And, but the point is that the Lord is working through that. Yeah. Is, is, is <clears throat> what makes a call a call? It's an awful lot more than just getting that phone call and say, listen, uh, mm. the Smith will call you. Yeah. Um, there's the, the, the God was busy in this for a long time already. Yeah. It's not and like this mysterious thing. Fully. It's not. No. It's no. Yeah. There was this good book. Mm. Uh, the guy's name is Kevin DeYoung. It's called Just Do Something. Mm-hmm. And he talks all about this. It's like, it's a very short, small book. But like, it's it's not this mystery. It's just look at the facts in your life. Pray about it. And there's usually a fairly obvious path. That's yeah. a very Dutch attitude. It is a very Dutch attitude. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. Which is interesting. Yeah, I I wonder how that is, you know, in different congregations or different denominations. It seems like a very uh, 
Dutch thing. Just go about your life and, and God will lead you. And not everybody has the, it's less of a feely kind of approach to something, but which is, you know, it's more my style, but I mean, I don't know. <laughs> it is interesting you put it that way. Um, I would, I would absolutely add to, to, to the, to the mix, funny word. Okay. Your hip. That's cool. Prayer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That you're ever before the face of God, Lord, what do you want of me? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's true for all of life. Mm-hmm. Um, he will eat. Yeah. The Lord is gathering his church. And yeah, getting a call to a congregation is part of that. But so is moving house. Um, that is part of it. The Lord is moving you to new location in order to be a blessing there. That's the intent. Yeah. Um, but yeah, then prayer. Lord, mm. show me where do you want me. Mm. It's not about me. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So really, it's it's ironic as we talk about individualism, but it's going to come down to an individual choice based on what you see happening in your life and in your church, where you're going to go to church. <laughs> or am okay. I incorrect? In yeah, no, I appreciate that. Um, prayer is so very, very important. Yeah. But it doesn't discount the need to connect and talk. We mentioned before right. yeah. um, a body Mm. fellowship you spend time together mm. it includes um look I've, buddy i've got this opportunity uh, boss wants to move me to i don't know st Catharines. now what do i do um yeah. should i or yeah. shouldn't i what are the arguments mm. pro and con um help me think this through mm. yeah dialogue right. dialogue yeah yeah <clears throat> well, it's well, what, it's what we're doing here. We're thinking yeah. through what is well, the church right. and, and yeah. whatnot, right? That's, yeah. yeah, that's the way to do it. All right, so you want to move on from that? I got uh, yeah, go nuts. Yeah. I got the best segue. No, I'm just no, you don't. Well, so we were talking about so all this talk about being called and and being part of a congregation or moving to another congregation assumes that you're. We've done our research on the what is a faithful congregation and and moving into a faithful congregation, but if we think about um i asked this question about withdrawal from from the from the church and we know the church is not something that we created it's something that god is that uh, jesus is gathering can we can you speak a little bit to like what is our role in that and how um if we withdraw to go to a non sister church a, a, even a false church what um, what responsibility do we have in light of that decision? As the consistory. Um, both, both as the consistory and as the individual member. And then how can we better understand this, the concept of withdrawal? What is that? Uh, okay. Really? Okay. Let me just um, back up for a second to set the stage for answering that sure. question. And that is that um, the church is the work of the Lord. But how do I know where the Lord is at work? I mean, I'm aware that not all money is true money. There is counterfeit. Mm -hmm. The devil is the master deceiver. He's the copycat. He's going to generate his assembly of saints (coughs) that look like but is not um, the real thing. How do I know where I need to be? (coughs) Where is Christ? That's the question. Mm. I need to be where Christ is. And you can't see him. He's ascended. But you can hear him. He's given his word. And that word is preached. John 10, the sheep hear the voice of the shepherd. See, where do I go to church? I must hear the word of God. And then we attach the pure word of God, right? The word pure to that phrase Mm -hmm. for the very simple reason that we're aware that devil would try to pervert that word, um, falsify it. It's through the word of the Lord works faith. Okay. That makes the preaching of the gospel the central mark of what is the church. Where do I need to go? How do I find the church, the true church, mm-hmm. preaching of the gospel? And of course, it comes in two forms. That's the audible, the preaching off the pulpit. It's the visible, 
at your sacraments, all must speak of Christ and his work. Mm. But what happens now when the congregation, a member of the congregation, doesn't want to take that word seriously? Um, there's where church discipline kicks in, where one member speaks to another. You talk about fellowshipping, so you know each other. You say, you know what, what you did there, what you said there, uh, how you're living, um, that doesn't reflect the renewing work of the Holy Spirit. And so you encourage and you admonish and you instruct, right? It's church discipline. It's the members looking <laughs> after each other. Um, yeah, the whole matter of Matthew 18, if somebody doesn't want to listen, you bring it to the elders and so on and so forth. And of course, that's where things get uncomfortable and somebody says, you know what, I'm out of here mm. and I'm going to withdraw. But what actually happens then? When you're withdrawing, what you are leaving is where Christ is busy, where you're hearing the voice of the shepherd. Mm. Do you have the right to do that? And, and, and I would argue, no, you do not have the right to do that. If somebody pulls you, uh, taps you on the shoulder and say, listen, uh, what you're doing, the way you're living, um, isn't the way God, isn't in step with God's revelation, um, you better take that seriously. Mm -hmm. After all, um, who are you to argue against God's norms? Mm -hmm. um, and okay, there's a whole discussion you can have there. Yeah, but I think I am within Scripture. Well, okay, discuss that then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But to if the if the, if the elders say no, but to your lifestyle ultimately is, 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 does not show the fruit of the Spirit. That's to say, dear brother, that you're going to go to hell. Mm. Oh, you better take that very seriously. Repent. Mm. And if you're not wanting to repent, of course, then, well, excommunication follows. Right. The whole point of excommunication is you think you're going to heaven, but you're not. Mm -hmm. You've got to take it seriously. But what is withdrawal? the end of the day, you're cutting yourself off. It's self-excommunication. Hmm. <clears throat> so you don't have the right to do that. Mm -hmm. So do we, we do treat these different in our church. In the King of Reform Church, we treat excommunication. There's a lengthy process for it um, with clear steps. And, and we have, um, it's, it's a gracious, um, experience because it, it helps to admonish and then and then slowly to you know hopefully bring someone back and 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 that i guess it's been designed to to do exactly that um but with a withdrawal it can be so sudden and i find that we treat it with a little bit more of a um kind of a passing glance at it like not so much there aren't steps. There's no steps to withdraw. It's just a withdrawal. And often it can be, you know, maybe in within the the discipline, within those steps of excommunication, the, the person will withdraw because the, it's just, I guess it's an uncomfortable situation. Um, and to be reached out to by all, all your brothers and sisters in the churches, you know. Not, yeah. Um, the where I struggle with it is, is, is it something that, you say that the person is self excommunicating themselves or excommunicating themselves basically should then the leadership of the church then follow through with an excommunication of that individual because the the keys of the kingdom of heaven were given to the the leaders of Christ's church um should then they you know lock the gates of the kingdom from that person um who in effect did that to themselves hmm. Um, yeah, um, I mean it's it's obviously a difficult yeah. conversation. Yeah, no, it, just... it, it it is a whole it it, it is a difficult thing. Uh, and elders, uh, I can testify to that from uh, being years on the consistory table. But elders very much struggle with this mm -hmm. um, and struggle emotionally. Oh, We're yeah, talking about so. a brother, mm -hmm. a sister. Um, it's hard. You mentioned the um, the form for excommunication and there's various steps involved. Mm -hmm. 
and somewhere along the line, the congregation gets involved and so on. Um, on the matter of, of uh, withdrawal, what we have done in, I'm going to say the majority of the churches where I've served, is um, if someone told the consistory, I'm withdrawing, what we did was tell the congregation, Brother mm -hmm. so-and-so has advised the consistory of his intent to withdraw. Mm. We cannot acquiesce without involving the congregation. Brothers, mm. sisters, to the degree you have a relationship with this person, please go and visit and talk and try to bring about a change of heart. Mm. And then we pray. Sunday after Sunday for this person. And typically we wait, give it a month or five weeks. And if there is no um, change of heart, no indication from anybody in the congregation that there's a change, yeah, then we say, you know what, we, we acquiesce and we advise mm -hmm. the congregation that we, okay, we have no choice but to. Um, this is the harsh reality. This person has broken with the church. Mm. Where, where, where Christ is busy, has withdrawn. Should the church, you say, turn around now and um, excommunicate, make a statement? Um, again, what we have done is advise the congregation that withdrawal boils down to right. self-excommunication. Hmm. Um, it would not be of any advantage in my judgment for the church now still to read the form of excommunication. No, I, and that is designed for the admonishment, not yeah. for the, um, it's not so much a formalization of the keys being, you know, or the keys of the kingdom being exercised. Mm -hmm. But it, I guess if, if we view it that way, then the final um announcement of the withdrawal is that um i mean there's passages like you know treat the you know the brother who leaves as an outsider you know that's yeah. it's just these 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 harsh kind of um we want to be gracious all the time but it's it's there is something very serious to that to mm -hmm. that situation um the Absolutely. reason yeah, part of the reason why I ask is, is it is it's a serious case, but then there's also the case where somebody will will withdraw their membership because we've talked about this to go to what is it, the FRC, yeah. the Free Reform Church. Um we don't have sister church relationships or or an ecclesiastical relationship with the church. Though you would I'm guessing not everyone would say, you know, well, that's not a false church, but that's you know. There are many true believers there. Yeah. And for someone to leave, they can't take their attestation with them like we would expect. Um, but there is a funny legal loophole. Is that you can go <laughs> yeah. USC and you then FRC. I know. Yeah. 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 So these this, these situations, like, I would have a hard time saying, okay, let's, no, let's, <clears throat> let's exercise the keys of the kingdom on this person. But also then having not, not being able to say that pushes me to say, well, then why don't we have unity with this church yeah and then it becomes well it becomes a positive thing that we can you know go Correct. and and we can yeah we can you know yeah, try yeah. To find I, unity, I, I i do think this question of leaving we need to when we talk about withdrawing or leaving um we need to look first of all at what are they leaving from mm. and not where mm. are they leaving to right if Christ is busy here, I've got a job here. Mm. I must not just pick up and go willy-nilly or because I feel like it or and we've covered this already. And now you talk about the free reform as a place where you go to. Um, and, and it's a fact. I, I, I would certainly feel different about Brother Billy going to the Furry from church, then Brother Billy, I don't know, going to the United Church or the mosque. The, the mosque, yeah. <laughs> that's true, yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, that, that, that's fact. Um, and, but, but as it is, we, we, we have no 
ecclesiastical fellowship with the free reform. You see, there's a, there's a uh, via via route yeah. in, and that, that, that is true. Um, but it's equally true that that our churches, uh, and, and I'm grateful for this, um, have warmed up relationship. I said that wrong. Relationships between the Canadian Reformed and the Free Reformed have warmed up. Yeah. Mm. Um, as with the Heritage Reformed, um, to say, of course, I think with United Reformed in the, in the last number of years, and I'm thankful for that mm. development. Yep. Mm. Um, the Lord is certainly at work also there, and we need to know that with deep gratitude. And uh, another thing I, I, I want to hook on to, uh, Tyler, is a comment that you made. Uh, there's there, there's so many believers in that church. It must make it a good church. Mm. Um, the whole matter of which churches true which is which church is a legitimate gathering of the lord um i discover that not by taking the gauging the spiritual health of the members but by studying the pulpit mm. mm -hmm. i prefer to be quite charitable and say that that uh, of the, I don't know, eight, nine churches in Smithville, that most of those members are in fact believers and we shall be together in the New Jerusalem. Mm. I don't know that, but I choose to think in those terms. But by saying that doesn't thereby mean that I think the United Church in Smithville or the Presbyterian Church in Smithville is, is a true church of the Lord. Mm. I happen to know differently uh, when it comes to what is preached off those pulpits. Mm. How is how are the sacraments um, maintained? How right. is church discipline maintained, and, and so on? Hmm. I wanted to get back to the uh, withdrawal. Do you think we've lost some of that uh, seriousness of it in terms of because you were mentioning? I think this might have been off the podcast previously before we started. But sometimes it seems as if, you know, okay, brother so and so is going off to this church, and uh, well, well, we we wish him well, like, and we don't want to say much more. Mm. Now, I, granted, things get a little political, almost, I suppose, with when you're dealing with federation relations, and you don't want to badmouth. And if it was an FRC church, like, yeah, I, obviously that makes sense. But you, do you think, especially, you know, we were talking earlier about this age of expressive individualism and not wanting to cast judgment and not wanting to be too harsh. Do you think we've lost some of the edge of that, some of the seriousness in withdrawal? I, um, <laughs> the honest answer is yes. The honest answer is yes. I, uh, with that answer, I do not want to, um, um, pass judgment on, mm. um, my brothers and brothers on the pulpits across the Federation. That's not my, calling to do um every circumstance will have its own nuance yeah sure i i, I accept that um but yes i think big picture we have come to downplay something of the seriousness of church discipline of excommunication of withdrawal um somewhere we've given more room for subjectivism on that topic than used to be the case. And I do regret that. Yeah. It's a, it's a cultural thing that seems to be pushing into the church. Well, yeah. I mean, it's good that we talk about this stuff because it, it is a mark of the true church. And if we, you know, if we don't continue with the discipline and understanding what it's not so much the discipline portion of it, but understanding what that is in, you know, in context of like, what is the church and why, why is it so serious that we take, you know, these steps and why is it so serious that we admonish each other um even continually like mm -hmm. you know as we as we meet together um yeah then we're going to lose something and and you know eventually that's going to be the mark of the church so you know but having said that i would say uh just identifying that uh, that development um is itself a very good thing mm. simply because that lays the onus on okay let's let's pull up our sock on yeah it. let's talk mm. about it yeah yeah. yeah, let's talk about it. Yeah. yeah. Do you think, I guess, yeah, you've been around many consistory tables over the years. How does 
this work and of course each situation is going to be different but in general what sort of advice or um yeah how how would elders and ministers go about talking to someone who by all intents and purposes seems to be engaging in what could only be described as church shopping how do you approach a situation like that like I mean, it's no secret. We've seen lots of that in, in yeah. the Niagara yeah. Peninsula and Hamilton. Yeah. And you know what? With, uh, with, um, <laughs> the distance between Fergus, where I grew up, yeah. and the um, Hamilton, Burlington area um, has not changed over the years. I mean, it's still X number of miles. Yeah. But the roads are so much better and the cars are so much better. It's very, very easy for kids to go from here to there to anywhere. And you see a church you like, well, that's where you're going to go. That's where your friends are. It's, yeah. it's, it's so easy to do. Um, on top of that, cell phones, uh, you can connect with your buddies that fast. Oh, we're going to be there? Okay, I'll be there. Um, in other words, we're talking about a, in that sense, a rather, well, there's a new element to the problem that wasn't there years ago. Um, I regret the development. I, 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 I do not think it is a, a healthy development. Um, I totally understand that young people want to uh, get out and about and see what's going on. But if Christ has given me a task in a given church, that's where he's joined me to and he says, you're a member of the body here then it becomes my obligation to be a living member here mm. as opposed to burning around all over the place. Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. I was talking to somebody um, the other day who mentioned, um, you know what, I, uh, I've got some good friends and I hang out with them. And I say, good. What happens on Sunday? I hang out with my good friends. We have some really good talks and we really hold each other accountable in God's service. And I say, I'm glad to hear that. And I'm back to the five friends on my hand. We spent a lot of time together. Most of the things that any one of these friends does, he does with the other four. That's the nature of a hand. Mm. But the rest of this body needs this hand yeah. mm -hmm. and this hand needs the rest of this body mm -hmm. and then i say just hang out with your friends or the five of you go and this week at that church next week at that church next week at that church look that's all great and good that you scratch somebody else's itch. But you're first of all, part of this body. Mm. And this body needs the hand to stay alive. I mean, it's this that grabs the spoon that feeds the mouth that yeah, yeah. revitalizes the whole body. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, no, the whole matter, the whole idea of, uh, of church shopping, it isn't a healthy one. And then I can, you want to say something? Well, I just came with this theory, actually, listen to you say that. So it's probably a combination of connectivity, people not getting married as early as they used to. So you have a higher degree of single young adults. And when you're a single young adult, it's probably harder to feel like you're, for whatever reason, it's probably harder to feel like you're welcome in a church because so much of the church functions as Families do this, couples do this, blah, 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 blah. And you're just a lot more transient as, you know, a single person as well. And I had a third reason, and I forget it now. But those are my two theories that I'm just working <laughs> on right now. And, and, and I dare say that there are a number of reasons that, that, that play into this as to why this happens. Um, and it's certainly important to, uh, to understand those reasons and address them. But yeah. at the end of the day, you can explain all kinds of reasons why these five friends do their thing together. Yeah. Mm. The end of the day, 
this five need the body and the body need the five. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, I understand that. I understand so, what the right thing is. But then how do we help that along? Like, I, I suppose from both. Okay, so here's the situation. The third point, by the way, was the uh, expressive individualism and just the, right. the you know, the yep. mantra of the age. Yep. So how can the church, knowing, you know, this brilliant theory I just came up with right now, right, right. which could, could very well be wrong. It's quite just a theory. But knowing some of these facts on the ground, how can we help these young people who are engaging in church shopping to find home and settle down? And like the responsibility goes two ways. Like it's on the young people, but it's also on, you know, the older folks in the, the home yep. church as well to be like, welcome arms, like mm. come in. We have tasks yes. for you. We have jobs. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Clearly more than having a program where they can come at seven on a Tuesday and be part of our church. <laughs> yeah. Like there's gotta be there's better just, ways to do that. Yeah. Well, that's something. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and I think like it's like in 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 so many things in church life and for, for really all of life, um, talking heads can develop programs that at the end of the day function as band aids. I don't discount this place for that. Mm. I also don't think that um, programs are Save. the yeah, answer. Yeah. Um, at the end of the day. With all respect, it's a question of faith. If this is how Christ is pleased to operate, I want to work along with Christ. Mm -hmm. Which means that I'm going to lean into being a living member of the body where Christ has joined me to. Um, maybe yeah. the mm -hmm. best friends are elsewhere. Yeah, that may be true. I'll go and see them, but... Might when be. the body needs me, I will be there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it might be a bit of sandpaper for a while. So, yeah. Yeah. Let's bring the countertop yeah. back into all of this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we're pretty much out of time, but uh, yeah. yeah. Anything else that we missed that was part of this, uh, should have been part of this conversation? <laughs> Hoya Maniki, you think? <laughs> There's more to talk about. I, I, I think that. Um, there is probably another element that's that, that that's worth bringing up, and 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 that is, um, I started with mentioning some of the developments in the fifties and sixties and beyond, um, and we're now that many years later. Where's Christ's church gathering work going? Mm. Um, and of course, that's a very difficult one to. Uh, to, to nail down simply because we do not know Christ's mind. We may work, though, with our own responsibilities and need to, and, 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 and that is to keep preaching the gospel, keep gathering around the word, uh, keep encouraging each other as flock of Christ, um, to listen to the voice of the shepherd. Mm. Um, Christ is coming back. He ascended. He is coming back. And when he comes back, that church that today is an incomplete house mm. will be a complete house and glorious at that. Read Revelation 21, 22. Um, the bride of Christ, perfectly, beautifully adorned. Um, What's to happen between now and then in the space that God still gives? However many years that might be, I don't know. But I do think continue to function as a living church. Mm -hmm. um, will the Canadian Reformed churches exist in Canada in 10 years' time, 20 years' time, 30 years' time in the form that we know it today? I don't know. Will it even exist as an entity, or will the Canadian Reformed have merged with the URC and the Free Reformed uh, and, and, and perhaps some other? I do not know. And I don't think I need to know those things. Mm. I do need to know the Lord has been pleased to give us a incredibly privileged task to work along with him. He's given us a rich heritage. Mm. Canadian Reformed comes with a history a heritage, mm. and we're wanting to hold on to that. But I think it's imperative um, 
that we keep working with Christ Jesus. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm at, yeah, finished my ministry. That's true, the active ministry. Um, but I love to remain involved in seeing how this keeps on unfolding. I find it an exciting venture. Mm-hmm. Um, and in that regard, I want to say to you and to so many more, it's an exciting time to be alive. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Always it is. is. But if Christ is king and Christ is gathering his church, why is today not exciting? Yep. Get after it. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, can't say much yeah. better than that. No, for that's, sure. That's been real talk, folks. Thanks for uh, thanks for coming on. This is an important conversation, though. So. It's been my pleasure. Yeah. All God right. Bless you and your continued task. Thank All you. Right. Thanks. Till next time, folks. Bye. Take care. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Real Talk. You can send us your feedback by emailing us at reformedrealtalk at gmail.com. You can find us on social media by looking for the handle Reformed Real Talk. You can find us online by going to realtalkpodcast.ca. We look forward to your feedback as that's what helps us grow and improve as podcasters. Real Talk is produced by myself, Lucas Holpluer, Tyler Vanderwood, and Tim Van Woodenberg. The theme music was created by Calvin Hutton. The table and cabinet behind me were made by Ethan Vanderwood of Eureka Woods. And finally, this sign in the studio was made by Zebra Signs. That's it for now, folks. Catch you next time. Bye-bye.